Okay, welcome. I'm Angie Berry. I'm the curator of the Gadsden Arts Center and Museum, and we are here with an Art Talk Live with Mary Sterner Lawson, an exhibiting artist here with us at the Gadsden Arts Center and Museum. I also have with me Sarah Black Sadler. She is our educator. She'll also be joining in on this talk and checking out the chat for any questions you might have. So we'll do questions at the end, You're, but you are welcome to put them in the chat while we're going through if you would like. Um, and we are recording this, so we will be posting it onto our website um, probably by early next week. And this is an exhibition of portrait studies just opened last week. It's something that Mary has been working on for um, the works themselves for decades, but the exhibition we've been talking about for quite a long time um, for several years, kind of putting it into development. So it's, it's a really great exhibition and it'll be on display through December, but in our Monroe Family Community Gallery. So Mary is an um, exhibiting artist um, in Georgia and Florida since the mid 80s. She's an Ohio native um, and she primarily works in watercolors, pen and ink, um, but she also works acrylic, graphite and even clay. You'll see examples of this. This exhibition is mostly her pen and ink drawings. Um, but she taught English for 32 years at Albany State University in Georgia. And she actually honed her portrait sketching skills during um, many of her prolonged academic meetings, I can only imagine. And in her teaching career and her years in Florida, she continued studio work in a variety of media and exhibited um, paintings in countless solo shows and group shows. And while she relishes um, illustrating social groups and natural, natural scenes, Lawson's particularly partial to catching decisively the fleeting spirit of a scene or person, which you'll see in these portraits. Um, over the years, she's amassed a surprising number of autographs, celebrity sketches, which is what a lot of the works in this exhibition are. These are autograph memories caught on paper. So um, welcome, Mary. Thank you. Glad to be here and glad several people have been able to, to sign in. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> uh, this is some of my earliest stuff uh, and very early. My father was really supportive mother as well, and an early book I got, and I don't know what I was, four or five, there's me when I was kindergarten age, and you can see my <clears throat> early renditions were not splendiferous, but then I was quite young. I think it's, I think it's pretty impressive. Um, so you mentioned that during your many meetings, you would sketch people and you really kind of compulsively sketch people. So has this portrait sketching been a habit to you all of your life? Uh, I think so. Just starting when I was even preschool, uh, when I would go to concerts, I would draw. I don't have some of the signatures of people that were in those concerts when I was, I'd say, elementary age. But, uh, but I ended up, anytime I went somewhere on a, on a cruise or if I was, in Biloxi, near one says Hard Rock Biloxi on the upper left, that one. That girl was just so catchy. If I would see a catchy face, um, a catchy pose, like those leisurely people uh, in the center there, I would end up drawing them again, just compulsively. Mm. And what made you want to get their autographs? I'm really not sure how that happened, except I think that was actually in those early concerts that my parents took me to kind of the, the equivalent of um, uh, artist series of, that we have here in Tallahassee. It would be different groups would come in. And I remember one of them was uh, Vincent Price spoke. He was a collector of art and art, art aficionado. And I remember going up to get his autograph. Not really sure what prompted me, except I discovered maybe through those experiences that I had an extra contact with someone that I was interested in as a speaker, as a musician. And that enabled me to have an extra five or 10 minutes or two or three with someone that I found to be important or interesting or fascinating. Hmm. Cool. So you said that you're drawing compulsively. So when and where are you when you're doing this? When do you do it? Well, like that dragonflies at Felix, Felix's fish camp, there's um, <clears throat> a group of later, ladies up in their, I don't know, 80s or 90s, I'm not really sure. Uh, okay, maybe I exaggerated the movie bit, and maybe yes, they are close to caricature, 
but my husband noticed that there were dragonflies in the back of them. And um, mm, uh, well, some of my titles on art pieces are humorous, and I think that one is, so they look a little bit like dragonflies. So, you know, I was at, I was at a restaurant there. Uh, the one in the middle, I was at the Lemoyne, and the speaker had a very good, catchy speaker, but her, her jacket was so colorful, too. And then on cruises, uh, which started doing, oh, I don't know, in the 80s, mainly, and on up, uh, there would be people around and about, and they, they their features fascinated. The one in the lower right, they fascinated me. They are just so gentle, and they caught my eye because there's just something. I think they have good karma, and I thought felt like catching that. The one on the far left, I was at Cozumel, and that woman, sometimes people look like they've experienced so much of life, and I think that's the case with this woman. She just had a, a depth of soul in her somehow. And it's just a simple drawing, but it caught how I felt about her. Uh, the same maybe with the one, the upper right lady. I'm not sure what her experience, I, mean, I didn't have the same feeling as the right and left. The lady in the Atlanta Hilton, uh, contemplating her sunglasses or life, sometimes it's something about the stance. Uh, this, in her case, all those swirls of lines of arms and legs and hair and face, caught my eye. So when something catches my eye in a, in a hotel, a, at a beach, uh, on a trip to China, something really, really important historically would, would cause me to draw. So is there something in particular that you're concentrating on, like a theme or idea with each one? I don't know. Um, my son sometimes used to say that I'm always seeing something shiny. <laughs> Meaning, I, dum, 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 reminds me of a t-shirt that says, I'm not sure what the title part of it is, but it says, oh, look, there's a chicken. Um, you know, like sometimes you're just caught by something that flashy or in my case, something maybe deep seated in a human being's face or humorous in a group of people like the upper left. I, I don't have necessarily something in mind, but um, I see something shiny and I draw it. <laughs> hmm. Well, and you also are adept in other mediums as well. I know you do, you know, watercolor. You just had an exhibit of your lichen over at the library recently. Um, and so I know it's not just people that capture you as well. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what your favorite medium to work with is? I guess I would have to say use of the pen, but I absolutely love to paint. Some people in, in Albany, probably know me more as a uh, like full sheet watercolor painter. And that's what I, they, I did a lot of. I exhibited at the Florida Seafood Festival, pieces like the lower left. Uh, that would be along the lines of something that I, some the things that I sold down there at Apalachicola area. Um, I don't know, I, I really like to work with different ones and it's almost with a pen or pencil or, well, depending on the scene, it's what I pick up. It's a easy, easy thing. That's why I encourage people to, to draw because it's, a, I'll have to say it's a cheap medium. You just need a pencil and a piece of paper yeah. for starters. But these others, of course, need a later, later complexity. Uh, the one in the upper left was a commission I did. And it's harder if it's what someone else takes to the heart's core. But this was um, a young couple and they were soon engaged and are now married. And I'm, I'm guessing it had a special meaning for them but it just kind of caught how I felt they must have felt perhaps on, on meeting. Maybe it was where they became engaged. I have no idea. But to me, it catches what I think they felt. And the one down lower left catches sort of how I felt about a scene. In, in those kinds of scenes, I'd almost have to say if I'm a little more happy with it, with the out, outcome, it's because it catches how I feel about something even more than how it looks. Mm -hmm. which I think good often art often does. It catches the feeling as much as the look. I know my stuff is a lot of it, like the lower two and the lower, lower right and the upper right are realistic. The one, the flower, I think it's called skunk cabbage, was an illustration I did for an, a book, Alaska book, A Guide to Alaska by writer Terry Breen. I edited and illustrated her that book, uh, Cruiser's Guide to Alaska, now out of print. But that kind of thing, I did look for sources, and then I just decided how to delineate it, line and color. 
So it just depends on when the lower right middle is a satire, as well as the year of the rooster kind of image. And the two um, of Finnish are ones, I took Finnish dolls that were actually, when I was in Finland, they were, there's a doll maker that made these and I extrapolated, just altered them a bit on how I wanted to. And one of the two, the lower one there, <clears throat> uh, it's called Alone Together. And I think it's just, it just catches a feeling. Mm. Uh, people usually, when I did the finished doll ones, they don't, I don't think I have any left. They all sold. Mm. Um, just depends where I am, when I am, and what people ask me to do. But I like watercolor very much. And I want to get back more to it. I've been doing so much line things left, like the two years of of um, lichens during COVID time. Yeah, I mean, like, so it's a special series. And you're also, you know, that your clay work, I know we've exhibited some of it here at Gadsden Arts, um, mm -hmm. which I think is really uh, special. Um, is there anything yeah. that tells you why you have to create something in clay versus watercolor or, you know, pen and ink? I like uh, the tactile dimension of use of clay and, I think if I had gone to a big institution, a big art school, <clears throat> I would have liked to have played with all the toys in the attic, including glass blowing, uh, jewelry making, and everything else. But clay is accept, you know, is accessible. Like the senior center and um, at the Lemoyne, you can work in clay and can end up getting a lot of time. And I started doing the clay in the, the '70s in Albany, Georgia, and I've taken workshops and classes and. I like the feel of it. You know, it's something you can work with and shape. I particularly like that better than the wheel because of the wheel. Well, maybe I just didn't have the patience. They say you have to do 900 pots before you can say you're a pot maker and clay. Wow. Uh, I didn't get that far and mine were a little lopsided, but I just like to build things. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I, I can totally understand. Um, so I want to go back to kind of the pieces that we're showing, most of the work that we're showing. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of experiences does your particular pastime of sketching more famous people like celebrities and stuff provide you with? Like, do you feel, you know, what, what are these experiences like? Well, it really is, it, it provides me interesting inroads into opportunities uh, that's actually what happened with this one of, of Ray Charles. It was the tail end of when I was here, actually uh, 2004 is when the drawing uh, listed there, but but it's actually um, <clears throat> the two, 2002. I should have put that, I guess. Hmm, I made a mistake on it, didn't I? But um, 2002, when Ray Charles gave a commencement address and it was stunning. It was the best commencement address at Albany State that I recall of. and. He was feeling over the braille before he spoke. Tremendous talk. But anyway, the impact of it uh, affected me considerably. And the experience did. Uh, the same with the one of the Neville Brothers hats, such as at the moon here in Tallahassee. And I was too far away. I wanted to draw their faces, but I have to be up close to get a face. I was fairly close with Ray Charles. I was in the front row because I was by then a full professor and they march in first so they can they have a better view of the speakers. But th th it provides these different experiences where um, in the Neville one, uh, couldn't see the people well. Notice they each had a distinctive hat and I definitely can draw better hats than that. But I quickly scribble scrabbled the hats and then the announcement was made, they will not be uh, signing. And I didn't then think of getting to, to uh, getting an autograph, but at the end, it seemed that Charlie, Charles was, a, was on the stage and he was shaking hands and I went up and showed him that. And I said, I kind of shyly, I guess said, would you sign this? And he flashed a smile and signed it. And then I got bold and said, do you think your brothers would sign it? And they were backstage. And uh, he sort of nodded, talked with a roadie, walked on, uh, over to me and said, you know, he'll get your pen and sketch in a sketchbook in a minute. So about maybe five minutes at least later, the roadie came over and got my equipment, uh, went, started to go back and the fellow next to me had a CD and tried to give it to the roadie for him to go back and with it to get signatures and the roadie said, mm -hmm. 
So he must have been under strict instructions. And anyway, five minutes or so later, uh, the fellow came back with all four signed under the hat. So that's one of my special ones. Provides special opportunities. Uh, gives me special insights sometimes into places and times and people. Yeah. Wow. Has anyone ever um, said no that they wouldn't sign a sketch of yours? Uh, you know, that happened when uh, the writer P.D. James in England w went to a reading of hers and I did a sketch that I'll admit it wasn't flattering. She sort of looked like the Pillsbury Doe woman <laughs> in her body face or like the queen, like the late Queen Elizabeth's mother, kind of pillowy face. And she was just sign either that or she was just signing the books, but she sort of shook her head and she didn't sign that sketch. Um, and I don't know, there, there's a lady here in town. I didn't ask for her autograph because I don't ask for stray people's autograph. <clears throat> well, that's one thing. That's why I don't get autographs of people if they aren't somebody that I go to listen to the speech of or go to the concert to hear. That's kind of an interesting mm -hmm. awareness. But uh, this lady in town never wanted me to show her um, picture to anybody because it showed the lines in her face. She said, I'm going to have to go get plastic surgery before you draw me again. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't know I already had done a drawing of hers in with some other people on a sketch, which I have exhibited, but she's passed away. I guess she doesn't know, but maybe she does. I guess you can exhibit her now. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, okay, so that said, have any of your renditions been criticized by their subjects? Has anybody, um, you know, besides the, the one who refused to, to sign it? Well, Chubby Checker did say, you make me look like a pit bull, but he signed it. I don't think it made him look like a pit bull. It looked just exactly like he looked up there on the stage. Um, some people can't accept how they look is the other factor, mm -hmm. you know, he, and uh, he, it, it, I actually took a photo. And when I, I went back to the room to finish up the drawing, the color that I added <clears throat> and looked at the, the photo and it looked exactly like this. <laughs> uh, now, he, I don't know, he wasn't exactly saying any official criticism otherwise, but that was, I think, a criticism a bit. Maybe I, he wanted me to flatter him more. And uh, Petula liked her drawing, Petula Clark, but she did say, I think you put a little bit of extra, I think you looked put a little bit of extra hair on the back of my head or something like that, you know, so. But. And didn't, um, I know we passed by this slide already, but didn't Yo-Yo Ma, wasn't he, he enjoyed his? Oh, he, he, that was a strange thing. It was in China in 1997 when Hong Kong was welcome back <clears throat> to China. And I saw a group in Wuhan. I was with a group of professors, a, a Fulbright Hayes study program to China month long one. And at the Wuhan airport, this group of Asian uh, youth orchestra kids, I, could, I knew that was that because it sat on the back of their, their outfits. And I was curious about it and asked a blonde lady that I thought would know English. I didn't know Chinese, I didn't know Mandarin. And she said they were with Yo-Yo Ma, who was with this Asian youth orchestra for this special event. And I thought, Yo-Yo Ma, because I love cello music, love string music and cello. And I said, is he here? And she, she said, um, she gestured over to where he was leaning against the wall. And I did super quick sketches of him, decided which one was better, went back to the lady and who, who seemed to be with him. and. Uh, I think a Boston University professor, and I said, uh, do you think he'd sign? But by then he had hopped up and he kept, he looked in detail through my sketchbook and complimented me and asked about the program and reached across and shook my hand like I was a celebrity. And I thought he was just, you know, it's just an absolutely amazing experience, but that didn't end there. I tried to get it to him, this, the collection of sketches that was part of my uh, assignment for this this Fulbright Hayes program uh, to turn that in and couldn't manage the first time Yo-Yo Ma came to Tallahassee. The second time, the man in charge of seven days of opening night was able to get it to him. And then months later, I got a handwritten note from Yo-Yo Ma thanking me um, for them. And it, it came from his home in Boston. I, I think I should frame it. I just am so tickled by it. Wow. 
And in case of Alton Brown, my husband and I were dra- traveling out west and stopped at a ditzy place, Mexican, I pardon me, people that live there, it's population 88, Mexican Hat, Utah. And uh, the, the food network was filming. And they said, yo, yo, the, the one that would be there is Alton Brown, the food chef uh, channel, food channels star. And he plopped down, I sketched him, and I was taped uh, in the sketching of him. And I um, uh, just was startled because months later, he that, well, we were on TV for a very brief t- period of time in a show called Feast on Asphalt. But months later, uh, Alton Brown, who apparently liked the sketch, sent us a couple T-shirts, a couple hats that said Feasting on Asphalt. Uh, so the experience is remembered that way. So they both were appreciative. And that, that was a neat experience. I don't expect something for my, my drawings, but that was a nice experience. Is there anybody that you wish you'd drawn and had them autograph it, like in the past? Uh, probably a few more literary ones that appeared at Albany State, although I got it quite a few while I was there. Um, and sometimes there's one I've drawn that I didn't get a signature on. The comedian David Brenner was on the cruise ship and, and uh, the sketch... I think turned out well, but I didn't get a chance to have him sign it. Um, I don't know if there's some others that I would would wish. I know John Lewis was the the civil rights figure, a very wonderful, wonderful, amazing civil rights activist. I wish I had sketched him and gotten an autograph. I was behind him in a line for a buffet, but I I guess that's not an easy place to draw someone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that would be tough. That would be. I've drawn in a post office line, though, when I have a box and I have to wait a long time. All around the edge of the box will have pictures of people in front that were in front of me. Wow. Weird, compulsive. <laughs> <laughs> so have you had any particularly amusing experiences because of your drawing? Uh, the, the, the one um, with the Neil Sedaka particularly was because this one just... I would say an ordinary sketch. I'm not head over heels about it. It's okay. But I went to a talk that was given for him and too many people got there first and were all the first rows and all I could see was his head. So this, I don't have the sketch there for you to see, but I put an arrow pointing down to his head and put Neil Sedaka. And then later on, a couple of days later, he was eating lunch and I, it's not polite of me to do this. This cause drawing has caused me to be a little impolite sometimes, I'll admit. Um, but I, he looked like he was finished eating. So I went over and I said, uh, showed him the sketch and he laughed uproariously. He thought it was so funny. And he signed it, Neil Sedaka. Um, the one with Alice Walker, she spoke at Bruton Parker and I got to help get a group of students from Albany State to go to hear her talk. And uh, a picture that ensued of, of, of Albany State students and colleagues uh, with Alice Walker was, you know, this, it wasn't amusing. It was just a good experience. And that's, it's led to some good experiences like that. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so what are, I know we had talked a little bit about um, Yo-Yo Ma complimenting and appreciating your drawings. Was there anybody else who gave you um, some good compliments? Or good well, Chihuly did. I mean, as you can see, if, if some of y'all listening have not seen a picture of Dale Chihuly. Honestly, that's what he looks like. He really sort of looks like he stuck his finger in an uh, electric socket and his the, the how his hair looks there resulted. And he also wears a patch because he was in an accident and lost the eye, sight of one eye. Uh, but that is a sort of an amusing experience because I was in a workshop at the Albany Museum of Art helping with a, it was a special one for children. And I just couldn't help but have it strong desire to draw him <clears throat> but I had no paper I hadn't brought along my sketchbook I was helping with the, what was going on with the kids and I asked does anyone have some paper and it turned out all it was available was some lined paper just plain notebook paper so I drew this on the lined paper and then after it uh, more than usual I, I kind of wished I could get an autograph but I was hesitant because the way he looked and that would be like kind of relate to your question are there some people you wouldn't sketch I mean but I got the I had the chutzpah to go on ahead and go up to him and he really liked it 
So I'd have to say he was comfortable with himself. And he wrote the word, good job. I took a photocopy down to the museum that's down in Florida, farther in Florida, and they really loved it um, too, but he liked the sketch. And the drifters, it, it is really good. The drifters have had some 60 various people in it over time, but they, they liked it. One of the drifters, uh, I saw one year, and then he came back on another cruise we were on and sang, and I mentioned I was the one that did the drawing, said, oh, you're the one. I have a copy of that, and I have it up in my office at home. So, you know, some people get a real kick out of it, apparently, of the drawings I've done. Wow. And I will say we've got in the gallery, you've got some really great um, confessions of a stealth sketcher, some really wonderful stories about some of these sketches that you've done that are on display um, and as well as uh, information about a lot of the different folks that you have. So that's available in a binder in the gallery. And then we'll also have that online on our website. Um, just before okay. I forget, I wanted just to tell you that. Um, but some people I know sometimes ask you why some of your drawings look different, like they'll vary in detail or technique or line. And, and what do you tell them? Um, maybe I just, it sounds sort of like as a kidding flip response, but I say it depends on which pen I pick up. Mm -hmm. And it's not really true. And I really like to, to draw in graphite sometimes too, you know, the soft feeling of it and you can get shading in wonderfully. Uh, of course, the, the, the Dale Chihuly one has, the way I've done shading differently. It just kind of depends. And I have had someone say, this looks like very different people have done these drawings. Well, they were all mine, but just the different time or the place, um, how I saw someone. Some of the ones on the um, group sketches are all angles. This, this to a degree uh, is an angle sketch and a couple others are as well too. Sometimes it's, the angle calls for something. Sometimes the time factor, like when I was drawing Yo-Yo Ma, I must have had only, you know, two minutes. So that's why it was just a super quick sketch. And others like with Chihuly, you know, I'm sure I spent some time on it, but not a tremendous amount of time. I just was real free form. And with the, with the drawing of the, the lines and scribbling around the way I did, um, it's kind of what strikes my fancy when I do it and how maybe, how I respond to the individual figures, I guess. Yeah. I don't have a theory about it. <laughs> I just pick up a pen or a pencil and go from there. Yeah, I get it, I get it. But I, oh, one thing I do have, I think I can teach people to draw. Mm. Some people, if I had a dollar for every person who said, I can't draw a stick figure, I could go on lots of worldwide trips, I swear. But I don't think it's it's true. I think a lot of people have been dissuaded, discouraged by parents, teachers, siblings, fellow classmates. And I think there's a lot of artistry uh, in every person in some respect, but I, I think I can teach anybody to draw at least on a certain level. That's awesome. Well, absolutely. I agree with you. I think that, you know, I, I, I tell my husband all the time, you know, that the, you know, people can learn techniques. A lot of that is just, there's that fear to overcome and knowing that everything takes practice. You know, you're not gonna, it took a long time to learn how to walk, um, just, you know, took several months. So it might take you a few months to learn to draw or at least so. so. Mm -hmm. But you have to ha have that desire, I think, so. Mm -hmm. Right. So is there anything in particular that you are grateful for having in this ex exhibit at the museum? Yeah, well, I'm actually really, really glad to have these drawings uh, reach the light of day. Um, this man on the left here, the late Robert Butler, one of the Florida highwaymen, one of the kind of the, not the very first group of, but is one of the Florida highwaymen was, um, whom I helped with editing and writing uh, for his autobiography, uh, not ghost writer, but he had a couple of different people helping with writing, but he saw my drawings and um, he said, what right do you think you have to keep these to yourself? I have to give him some credit for some of the impetus behind my uh, being willing to show it to the people at Gadsden. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> and, it's among, I mean, I must have over here in my studio, I bet I was trying to calculate how many 
pages or I must have 10 or 12,000 drawings. I don't know in all the sketchbooks I have. And they're, they're fairly useless <laughs> um, in, in some respects, unless someone wants a good many sketches for various marketing reasons in some respect. I don't try to market them. But he encouraged me. And when, for my help with him, he paid me, first off, the, the one you see at the lower left. And I spent so many hours. He stayed at her house some and um, just really worked quite a lot on the templates and images that he, I don't know how much he actually ended up using, but I spent a tremendous number of hours. I said, Robert, I said, you owe me another painting. And when he was at the house, this is a big one that we have. These are both the payments that went up above. He said, well, what subject matter? The one on the lower was our backyard in Albany, Georgia. I had a three window studio overlooking the scene. It was wonderful. But this one up above, I said, just paint from the heart. And using some of my acrylics and in our sunroom, he started that painting, which he finished later. And it might be just, it might be things that um, he put in others of his paintings at times, but he just painted spontaneously the scene. And he brought, he finished it back at his place and brought it back eventually. And I am just, you know, just delighted by it. I think my husband helped title it Into the Mist. These birds are flying up into the mist. But so I, I he's responsible for this drawing I did of his, which he, and which he signed. Mm -hmm. Well, that's such a beautiful story. What a neat relationship. Um, we do have some time for questions. There was already one in the chat. Mary, do you mind if I ask oh, you? Go, now? go ahead. Please ask questions. I don't know that I have the answers, but I can give one. Okay. Um, Stephanie Leach says, it's very interesting to see that Alton Brown's signature seems to include an image of his own. That's what the sketch next to him is, right? Or maybe you inspired mm -hmm. his own image of himself? Um, do you find people inspired to make art from your artwork? I certainly have been inspired to make art by your artwork. Oh, well, good, good. Well, um, Stephanie, you know, actually, maybe I helped inspire Stephanie and her daughter to keep going on things because I think they drew some this past summer. But this particular Alton Brown one, he said, makes made some comment about that's a logo he puts on this thing sometimes. I know if you ever get a letter from me, I put a, it's like sea oats on the envelope. You'll know it came from Mary's Turner Lawson if, I, if you get one that looks like, has that on it. But this must be a little logo he puts on. But I, I've had people that have been inspired by it. And um, I like to think that by my saying, you can learn to draw, that some people will go on into thinking of it and to, you know, to trying to, to draw, to taking classes at, you know, the Lemoyne at Gadsden, at the, the, the center, senior center. Uh, there are so many opportunities. I think one of the main things that people encourage, uh, don't discourage if someone doesn't seem to be uh, good at the start, don't discourage. Um, Stephanie, Stephanie uh, has, oh, sorry. <laughs> did Stephanie have some more? I saw something pop up a minute. Yes, yeah, I'll read it out. Um, she said, I would love to hear more about how to start to teach people to draw. Why should people learn to draw? I'm having an uphill climb trying to convince students to handwrite their papers because of the cognitive connections that I hand activity cements. Hmm. hmm. How to encourage them, how to get them going. I don't know. I, I, I wonder if there's been a disconnect over time that happens way too early and this happens again back when children are young, and it could be the kid in the next desk make fun, makes fun of your drawing, or the teacher disparages it. I actually know of a, a very good graphic artist with a degree in it that was discouraged by a teacher who criticized her, and it was entirely unfair. She's a splendid artist, and professionally was very successful as one, and does wonderful drawings, but a teacher uh, if she would have listened to that teacher, she would have stopped. I think just keep up the encouragement and try to persuade people that they may think the way they're thinking because of some what someone has said to them or what they ingested from reading. It's discouraging if you see what someone someone who can draw ever so much better than you. And I'll I'll be honest that 
if someone asks I'm an artist, I'm awkward about saying I'm an artist because I think of the great drawings of Daumier. You know, I just think of all, all kinds of other drawings, uh, amazing illustrations. And it's easy to think, I know what a real artist is. I'm not an artist. I, if, um, and there's a, there are a couple of books I have. I can't remember the name of the one of them, fellow that says if people ask him, are you an artist? He says, I like to draw. And I think that's kind of the way I feel about it. I like to draw. I also paint and do clay. But I don't know. Uh, encourage those people that are hesitant to keep going, to not, uh, to listen to what they want, can do. If they think it's what they can do, they might stop. So I think it's a, a, an encouragement factor, you know, continued encouragement. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, Sarah, as our educator, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, yeah, I would absolutely say that encouragement and positive reinforcement is a really important message. And also, I think um, uh, there's a long history of art in general or art institutions feeling like intimidating places and just letting people know that like this is for you. You are welcome in those places. You can understand it. It is available to you. Your interpretation is totally valid. Um, yeah, I think letting people know that they are welcome and accepted and encouraged in, in those fields is really important. I would, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Paul. Hi, Paul. Uh, I, I would love to see courses offered at both Gadsden and Lemoyne taught by Mary Sterner Lawson. And the name of the course is I can teach anybody to draw. Uh, <laughs> great that, idea. I think that I think that offering would we would sell out. We would have waiting <laughs> lists. That is um, yeah. just a, a, a wonderful it's a wonderful thought. And I think it, it's true, as Mary said, to a certain level and a great confidence builder for any of us who were would who tried and were told by a teacher, you know, just do your music and don't worry about drawing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it would be great. I, I may enroll in that class, Mary, when you <laughs> get it up and running. A little bit more um, about what we have coming up at the museum here. Um, Next week, we have an opening celebration for Mary's exhibition, as well as the Marvelosity of the Art of Alex Ross. And we have exquisite miniature um, paintings that are amazing. And this is all gonna be next Friday, September 23rd from six to eight. Um, this is very much a superhero party. Um, please, uh, if you'd like to come dressed in your superhero costume, you can get free admission. And, um, you know, if you have any kids, grandkids who you think might have um, an interest in any superheroes, um, Alex Ross is a comic book illustrator uh, for Marvel Comics, and we have his original beautiful large watercolor gouache paintings on that will be on display and some sculptures. So Sarah's going to have some really fun things in our art zone for kids um, to enjoy. We also have an art talk live coming up in October um, about female superheroes and their role within comics. And um, Mary's work is going to be on display through December 3rd. So you've got a little bit of time, but you know, by all means, come over, book a tour um, with Sarah to, to learn more. Um, about her work. And then we've got, if you'd like to take a survey about this um, Art Talk Live, we would always appreciate surveys. And Sarah will also send that out, um, post this. We'll uh, put this recording up on our uh, website. And um, yeah, hope you all will come and visit us. And we appreciate you joining us today. And thank you so much, Mary, for, for sharing your work with us. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Thank everyone, you. we appreciate you and hope you have a lovely rest of your Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.